Hi. So we're here in the room. Uh, my name is Andreas Hager. Uh, it rhymes with Birgit Mager. <laughs> but we're not relatives. Uh, but I do sense that we share passion. And my passion is this. This is one of my favorite pictures. It's uh, outside Söderskjökhuset. If you can walk, you can walk up the stairs. It's uh, a bit of a hard work, but you, you get there, it's close. If you have a wheelchair, it's 570 meters that way. And the last 200 meters are up a hill. This is a hospital I love. I work with it uh, for quality improvement and uh, so... Uh, and so my pa passion, understanding and learning about what kind of society we have and how it is to live the life as a patient. And I have a mission, besides my professional mission as a lawyer, I have a mission stated by my daughter. This is her mission statement for something we call patient's world. These are her words and the pictures she has chosen. She says, I want to help others to understand us patients better. I want you to learn more about things that patients say. Sometimes you do not listen or you do not understand everything that we want to learn. I want you to come home and find out more about how it is to be patient. She is nine years old and she has translated uh, to English with Google Translate and PowerPoint they learn in school nowadays. So, sharing passion, not only Birger, Birgit Mager, who will introduce herself shortly, but also the organizations that are hosting this webinar series. On behalf of Vinova, the Innovation Council, Swedish Association of Regions and uh, Counties and Regions, and the Swedish Industrial Design Foundation. Very welcome to our webinar. We will start with some 25 minutes of presentation from Birgit Mager, followed by discussions led by you uh, through Twitter, and also we have a microphone in the room if you have questions here. The Twitter hashtag is as it has been now, this is the fourth webinar, uh, Design FBH, Design for Better Health. Hmm. Okay, thank you, Birgit, and very welcome. Well, thank you, Andreas, for introducing me, and thank you for all the organizers for making this possible. Thanks to everybody who is taking time for attending this session. Uh, I think it's a great opportunity to connect uh, via a webinar with people all over the world and I'm sitting here very comfortably in my office in Cologne. Um, well, a couple of words about myself. Uh, I'm a professor for service design at the Cologne University of Applied Sciences for 17 years now. So I think I can say with good right that I was the very first person ever trying to think about service design in a systematic way and to teach it. And uh, I'm still enjoying to do it. Many, many things have happened throughout these 17 years, which make life really exciting. Um, I have uh, founded two research centers here at the Cologne University that are applying service design for public and uh, 
um, and professional services. I'm a co-founder of the International Service Design Network, which has been constantly growing for the last, uh, well, from my perspective, for the last 10 years, and which is now a great network of professionals and researchers and academics throughout, uh, well, about 400 people all over, companies and, and organizations all over the world. And, well, when I was preparing for the seminar over the weekend, I looked at the two English-speaking lecturers that you have already had uh, in, in the seminar, and I was very impressed about the amount of um, professionality and how deeply they apply service design thinking in the health sector. I am not a health specialist, so I thought that for the time that we are going to share, I will try to look at the way that we educate young people in service design and I will do this by introducing four service design projects that we have been doing throughout the last 17 years. And with these projects, I want to, to show the way of service design thinking that we are applying. So I hope that this is going to be interesting for you. And uh, I'm really looking forward to the discussion that we are going to have afterwards. The first project that I would like to introduce is a project that... Um, we have uh, done in the year 1996. Is the slide showing? I'm only seeing the introduction slide. Oh, now it's loading. Okay. It was a project about homelessness. Uh, I've talked about it a lot, so I'm giving a short summary. It's a student project, and uh, in the beginning, I just asked the students to create innovative services uh, relating to homelessness. So the students uh, applied design research techniques. They did desk research, collecting facts and figures and data about homelessness, starting to create system maps and stakeholder maps. Who is it that we need to, to look at when we talk about homelessness? They did interviews with the social service providers here in Cologne, and uh, they did interviews with the city of Cologne. And then, of course, they moved towards the the user perspective, and uh, we did a lot of uh, design-led ethnographic research, shadowing homeless people, doing interviews, uh, trying to enable them to document their everyday life. We also spent time outdoors throughout the nights, leaving keys and money at home to experience what it is like to be homeless in the city of Cologne, having no money and no warm place to go to. This research was very, very impressive 17, no, 16 years ago, 15 years ago for the students. And, uh, and it showed that uh, basic design research techniques can be applied to services that they have been, that they have to be adapted to the system perspective, that they have to adapt to different user or stakeholder needs, um, but that we can learn a lot by, by applying design research to these systems. Based on that research, the students identified uh, pain points within the system and they identified the core needs of uh, the homeless people. And based on this understanding, they started to, to innovate and to build ideas to, to see what could be different. For example, they felt that a permanent address is really important for homeless people. Otherwise, there is no way to connect to bureaucracy or to potential uh, employers. So we thought mailboxes would be a good idea in a, in a service location for homeless people. And we did co-creation around these ideas, meeting with the service providers, meeting with the homeless people and showing our ideas as little mock-ups or prototypes. We created a potential location for this innovative service around homelessness. And what you see here is um, for one thing, medical services, basic medical services for homeless people. Hygiene was a big issue, uh, not as if it would be on a daily basis, but there was a great need for hygiene services that would you know, not be secretly sneaking into some, some uh, place to go to the bathroom or to, to get some water. And what was really important to the students was to, to create a place that would welcome the homeless people as guests and to have a reception where they would be received as guests to this service. Um, 
so uh, they also built a prototype of the final service offering. You see here the reception area, the medical service area, a laundry machine, um, bathrooms, showers, and all the things that relate to the service. What we also created was an organizational structure that was planning for the homeless people to work in this place. So we were creating jobs for homeless people, enabling them to work for the time that they were able to work, one hour, two hours, so mini jobs uh, that would be at least an opportunity to step back into working structures. In the end, we presented this prototype and the concept for the, the service to the city of Cologne and to the service providers in the city of Cologne, social service providers, to the churches that play a major role in social services. And it was very funny because everybody was unanimously enthusiastic about this idea. And I always say that this enthusiasm was due to the fact that it was a service design project that worked very, very close with the different stakeholders that did co-creation activities, trying to adapt the ideas that we were having to the needs of the users and also integrating the ideas of the users into our system. And it was due, the success was due to the fact that we worked very visual. We created mock-ups and prototypes. And so in the end, it was somehow as if this service was already there and people could really relate to it. The enthusiasm that this presentation created was very strong and it led to the launch of the Gulliver, the survival station for the homeless in the year 2001. Um, Gulliver opened its doors right beside the main train station here in Cologne and it was in the end more than we had ever uh, conceptualized. It grew in the process of realization. So today it is existing in Cologne and it is uh, also a place where you get some hot drinks and some soup to eat. Um, it does put the laundry place into the location and you see it is not a designed place. It is a place that is made for people it is made with the resources that are available. It is made under the perspective of usefulness and usability. And it is very much appreciated by the homeless. Throughout the last uh, 12 years almost, we have not had cases of vandalism, which is quite amazing in such a difficult environment where this service is being located. Gulliver provides day beds where people can sleep in a dry and protected environment for a couple of hours throughout the day. And by now it also provides uh, internet access so the homeless people have access to, to wireless LAN and can surf the net. So I really like this project. It was the very first project uh, in service design ever and for the students it was really a big challenge. But it showed that the application of design methodology and design thinking to service systems can be really successful by uh, looking at the system in a holistic way, by involving the different stakeholders, by co-creating, by creating mock-ups and prototypes, by, um, yeah, uh, in, the, in the end, by applying design thinking and doing in order to create services that are useful, usable and desirable from a user perspective and valuable and different from a provider perspective. So what I'm showing here is basically the, the very basic definition of service design. And um, I think it's a, it's a good definition because it takes both perspectives into consideration. It does put a focus on the user perspective but it also makes very clear that in the design of services, we have to uh, work with all the stakeholders. So the provider perspective is a very important perspective and uh, the value that a service creates, not only for a user, but also for providers. So throughout the years, um, the process of service design has been defined and uh, um, today we basically talk about four different phases of service design. We say that 
we usually start with an exploration phase where we try to learn as much as possible about the system, about the different stakeholders in the system, where we open up our, our boxes and try to expand our knowledge in order to then in the end synthesize it and come up with key findings and design challenges that lead us into the second phase of the service design process, which we call creation or ideation phase, where it's again about opening up and developing ideas about allowing creativity and, and design techniques for creativity. But then again, conceptualizing and building mock-ups and prototypes that really make ideas visible and, and understandable. The third phase then leads into reflection, which is often related to, to testing these prototypes, to refining them, to creating business models that take into consideration the market value or the amount of investment necessary for, for the implementation. And then in the end, it's about implementation, where the design competencies of a service designer are more about communicating, uh, educating, uh, and, and these kind of issues. So this is an overview of the service design uh, process. Throughout the last 17 years, I found that there are different levels of service design. There is a very important and very basic level that I describe as the interface level, where service design competencies are applied to the interface between an existing service provider and users. So this is where we go on journeys, on customer journeys, where we analyze touch points, where we look at service evidences and try to improve or innovate the front stage experience of a service. This is a very valuable approach in service design, which can lead to, to breakthrough changes in the way that the experience of a service is designed. But today we more and more often also find the system level of service design, where the service design team looks at the backstage and sees how can new organizational structures, new, new processes, new roles lead to a better performance at the interface level. And last but not least, we do find a lot of service design projects that are really relating to a strategic level where we think about a completely new positioning of services and radical innovation of services. I think these three levels of service design relate in a way to uh, something that the Swedish Industrial Design Council has done very early uh, about uh, different phases of design, no design, uh, design as a, as a styling, design as a process and design as a strategy. I think this resembles the development in service design and I would emphasize that all these three levels are very valuable and important. It often depends on, on the amount of resources you have available and the challenges that you are facing, uh, to what level of service design you go. I would like to, to show a second project um, that we did with the students here in Cologne a year ago. It was about uh, a waiting room of an emergency unit of a hospital. The manager of the hospital approached me and said, Birgit, you know, uh, we are rebuilding our, our venues in, at the hospital. We have an architect there and we have an opportunity to really change the place. And our waiting room is a big issue. Uh, it is very, very ugly. It does not provide a lot of you know experience to the the, client, the the patients that are waiting there and you are a design school so we would like you to think about this waiting room and improve it in the context of our our architectural change now what do you think was my answer i told the manager of the hospital that well maybe we would not be able to do a redesign of the waiting room but that we would invite him to come to a project meeting and talk about the framing and the reframing of the project. So the manager of the hospital came to our school, to the Köln International School of Design, and um, we had a very intense meeting with him to, to understand what are the issues related to waiting 
at the emergency unit. And in the end of this meeting, we agreed with him that we would not redesign the waiting room, but that we would improve the waiting time, that we would improve the waiting experience, and that we would do all this under consideration of the needs of the different stakeholders in the hospital. So very often in the beginning of a design project, it is really about framing and reframing. We experience that clients come and they already have solutions in their mind. So as a design team, we have to question whether the solutions that they have in mind really uh, have a chance to solve the problem. So we are questioning whether the client has really understood the problem and taken the time to ask the right questions. Often clients come and they have no idea of what they really want. They want to do something different. So helping them to frame and reframe what, what we are doing is a very important early phase of the project. And sometimes we need to do pre-studies before we can even come up with a final briefing for a project. So in this case, we agreed on improving the waiting time and the waiting experience. So in a second step, we started to, to build the stakeholder map and to create an understanding whose needs are relevant when we talk about the waiting situation. So on our stakeholder map, we had the doctors, the nurses, the administration, uh, of course, the patients. Uh, we had there also the management and, uh, and the architect who was in charge of redesigning uh, the place. So built on that stakeholder map, we enabled um, the hospital to have an interdisciplinary team set up for this topic of the new waiting experience. And we had a very first team meeting with an interdisciplinary team at the hospital. And that was a bomb. It was such an amazing meeting because the doctor, for example, he was presenting his perspective on the waiting situation. And he said, you know what? When I have to go through that waiting area, I take off my white coat so nobody can identify me as a doctor. Otherwise, you know, they would be just clinging to me. The, the nurses said, you know, I do not enter that waiting room at all. I use the, the, the sound system to communicate with the patients because otherwise, if I go out there, I'm in trouble. They wait there for six hours and they don't dare to go away from the waiting area because they are afraid to, to miss their call. Uh, so it's an atmosphere like war out there. We talked to the administration and they said, please do not come with any more suggestions for television screens or water, uh, um, water uh, um, bottles. Uh, they have used knives to destroy the water bottles that we have put out there, and they have uh, they have stolen the uh, the the, uh, the cables from our television screen before. In the end, they finally stole the television screen completely. So do not come up with stuff like that. So all these issues were shared in an interdisciplinary team meeting, and it really created a lot of awareness on how relevant and how, how painful this issue was and how much need there was for change. So energy for change was created, which is very important in a service design project. So built on this uh, interdisciplinary team meeting, we started to go into field research. And of course, we did observational studies. We uh, did a lot of interviews with all the different stakeholders. Uh, we went into the customer journey ourselves. We also invented design games and uh, enabled the different stakeholders to share their different perspectives on the waiting situation using a design game where we had kind of like uh, put the floor plan and made uh, Playmobil figures walk through the floor plan. We used post-its to, to summarize the, the pain points and also the ideas for change. So we did this kind of creative service design research, which has a value in itself because it creates platforms for playfulness, for creativity, for change of perspective. And the doctors and the nurses were really ha having fun to work together. And those of you that are in hospitals know that it's not always easy to connect the different stakeholders within 
uh, a hospital system in an open-minded and creative way. So this is what the design games did. We also did uh, work alongs where we stepped into the roles of nurses and worked with the hospital on the backstage for three days. And that was also a very, very valuable experience because we learned so much about the time constraint, about the administrative uh, double works and, and, and uh, very time intense uh, paperwork that for doctors and nurses had to be fulfilled. We learned about language problems because not everybody backstage speaks German. We have doctors back there that come from Southern Europe or Eastern Europe. We have um, Asian doctors and there are lots of communication problems that in the, in the end have an effect on the waiting situation. And we observed uh, the space, how do the nurses and the doctors and the patients use the space and what would be an improvement from the spatial arrangements of waiting situations so that when drunk people are coming to the ambulance, uh, to the emergency ambulance, that they can be cleaned before they go to the doctor's room and that they don't have to be carried through the whole hospital. Little issues like that were addressed in the space, space analysis. And in the end, we came up with blueprints and uh, an understanding of the system and the processes within that system. So the synthesis of all these findings uh, led to then um, a process of co-creation. And in that process of co-creation, we focused on three different issues. One was the information, because we felt that there was a big gap in information about waiting time throughout the whole customer journey. So for our project, we created mock-ups of new websites where the patients would be informed about the amount of waiting time that they would have to spend if they go to the ambulance. We informed on the website and throughout the whole customer journey about new services that would make the waiting situation more flexible, like SMS, uh, like text messaging, like uh, waiting at different places, not having to wait in the waiting room, uh, at all different types of uh, um, things that make the waiting experience better from different perspectives. But we also changed the the organizational structures within the hospital, creating new roles at the at the front desk um, so that administrative tasks were simplified and uh, taken away from the nurses and doctors in, to enable them to focus on the patients in uh, the ambulance. And we created mock-ups for the new waiting area, redesigned it. So this was basically the starting point of our collaboration. This was what they had expected us to do to create a new waiting area. But as you can see, we did a lot more and we looked at the system as a whole. We looked at the journey and the different actors within that system and tried to improve the overall waiting situation. So from a more methodological perspective, perspective, in exploration phase, we do start with the framing and reframing of the project in order to come up with a briefing. Uh, this is often interrelated with first steps of research. Um, but when we have the briefing, we go into field research. We try to do it as much as possible with interdisciplinary teams involving user groups in an active and playful way with different types of design-related exploration tools. And then when we come up with a synthesis, this is a starting point for the second phase, the creation phase, where we work again very visually. So I think I have to hurry a little bit, but I would like to, to invite you for a third project, uh, which gives a bit of a different perspective again. It is a hospital-related project, but from a catering perspective. Uh, a very uh, big catering company approached us and asked if we could not do a service design project to create innovative services uh, related to the topic of malnutrition. Mm, they were already offering um, services with uh, nutrition-rich uh, uh, products, but they were not very successful, and we found that hospitals were not really, really buying it. So we did first of 
first phase of desk research, and we found that 80% of all elderly people have malnutrition probl problems today when they come to a hospital. And this affects the curation. Uh, it, it lasts more than twice as long in general, and the mortality of people that have malnutrition is significantly higher. The existing offerings for special nutrition are not really successful because, for one thing, money is a really important factor and um, the uh, catering is like the last, last thing in the, in the chain uh, where usually the hospitals really try to save a lot of money and they don't really think about investing into catering and nutrition. So what we did is we found one hospital partner who was already having a special nutrition for uh, um, malnutrition patients. And we went and analyzed uh, what are they offering. And we found that the offerings uh, in the context of malnutrition were very badly communicated. They were very badly organized they were very badly accepted by the nurses and by the doctors because they created extra costs and they created extra work. So they were not really accepted and they were not really, well, given to the patients in an attractive way. So this is what the patients that were diagnosed with mal malnutrition in the end would get uh, and they would not at all understand why they would have to drink it and what value it would have. So we found that the whole system of malnutrition-related services was not designed at all. And our creation challenge then was to create a unique selling proposition for a caterer in this point as in a B2B environment that would be an attractive and transparent solution for the patients and their families with a long-term effect that would make it easy for the staff uh, to do and to evaluate that would be, be attractive for the doctors by giving them extra benefits and that would have to be attractive for the hospital management. So those were our creation challenges. And as human and user-centered designers in a very early phase of the project, we thought that we would motivate the nurses to give more attention to the malnutrition patients, to spend more time making sure that they eat the food that they should eat to get better. But after doing all our research, we found that there is no way to put extra burden on nurses or extra burden on doctors, that we would have to create a service that would be very much a self-service uh, uh, thing. So what we came up with was a service that we called uh, Nutri Plus, and that would be as a system, as a process, be related to things that were done in the hospital anyway. So, for example, in the we created an integrated diagnosis interface at the registration of the patients, where the malnutrition diagnosis would automatically lead to a specific process that was low was organized around a tablet pc that the patients would get themselves and the patients with this tablet uh, are enabled to create their own menu they have a do-it-yourself interface where they can individualize their menu order online give feedback to the quality of the food and they would get access to edutainment around good nutrition and access to after surgery care and back at home nutrition programs. So this do it yourself interface of a tablet PC is the heart of this service, uh, enabling the patients to select the food that is good for them from a, from a specific menu and uh, well, uh, taking care of themselves. We also redesigned the evidences in the whole process, creating uh, well, more attractive information diagrams, more attractive containers for the food. And we also created a system that integrated the nurses and made the work very efficient for them. For example, the nutrition assistant in the hospital uh, would be trained to work with the tablet PC and via access code would get all the statistics and all the feedbacks on the nutrition um, on, on one click. 
um, they could print out or, or do presentations about the effects of malnutrition statistics and they would get um, training documentations etc etc et so we tried to create a service on a do-it-yourself basis with a, a technological intervention that would be very much focused on the efficiency of the system but at the same time at the usability and usefulness this service um, is now being in the test phase with our hospital and at first uh, at the first um, uh, evaluation signs it seems to be working really good and it has a very high acceptance within the system so this is something that we do where we try to use technology in order to to be very efficient about services and also from a very holistic perspective so give me five minutes for a last little project and then I think I'm really looking forward to go into discussion to see what, what does this mean to you. The last project I want to present was also a student project that we did. And it was a project that we did with the city of Eindhoven. The city of Eindhoven approached us about a project of drug addiction and street prostitution. Uh, it is a problem that they have already tried to solve in the city of Eindhoven by uh, dedicating a specific area of the city uh, for prostitution, um, having a container of the Salvation Army there, having a specific security service there that would take care of the security of the women. So by this intervention, they had solved wild prostitution and wild uh, dealing with drugs in a town area of, of Eindhoven and controlling the problem. But the controlled problem cost the city of Eindhoven 500,000 euro every year and that is taxpayers money so they asked us whether we could not try to to create a service that would solve this problem in a better and more in a, in a human and efficient way so I set up a student project and um, we spent approximately two weeks in Eindhoven trying to understand the system, trying to understand how does it work today, what are the different well, actors that are involved in the system, who are the stakeholders besides the women who are drug addicted and prostituting themselves. So we found that the caretakers, the Salvation Army, the social service providers play a major role in the system. We found that of course the pimps uh, that, that send the women out to prostitute themselves play a major role. The men that are clients of these services play a major role in, in sustaining the service. And of course the politicians and the citizens of Eindhoven play a role in the system. So after we had analyzed the stakeholders and their needs and interests in this uh, topic, uh, we, we identified those stakeholders that we were able to influence and that we could try to build our service system with. So we decided that when we look at the, the clients and the pimps, our chances of interventions are rather low as a student project team coming from the city of Cologne. So we decided to, to focus on the political perspective and the social service provider perspective and the women perspective when we create our service innovation. So what did we do? Uh, we focused on the caretakers, on the social service system. And it was really interesting because in our research, we had identified nine different units in the city of Eindhoven that were taking care of these women. It was the pol police, it was the health service, it was the social service, it was the Salvation Army, plus others that were somehow related to these women, but none of them really knew the prostitutes. So our recommendation to the city of Eindhoven was to bring together all these different uh, service providers into one system that would be able to create a one-to-one -one relationship to the women, supporting them in a process of change. Uh, we focused on the environment and we found that the women were already connected to a container at 
at this area where they were prostituting themselves. But when we started, that container was a place to warm up, to have cake and coffee and to find free condoms. So we suggested to change that environment into environment that would inspire change, an environment where they would get miniature learning uh, um, programs on manicure, on, on, on hair cutting, on things, and that they would take responsibility for that environment themselves. Um, and we created a system where the women would become part of a program where they would get award, rewards, where they would be supported from the spark through the change and to, and to the stabilization of changing their life. So the women would be able to go into a program where they would be collecting credit points that could later be changed into money, where they would have this one-to-one -one relationship with their caretakers, where they would go through detox and then get into a support program of back to work. So very shortly, this was the, the recommendations that we made and we created a system that we call Lebenskracht. We presented this to the city of Eindhoven in the year 2010. They implemented a pilot and it was very successful. And already in the, at the end of 2011, the newspaper of Eindhoven um, uh, uh, reported that the Tippel zone, which is this prostitution area, is closing and Levenskracht is opening its doors as a change program for the women. Today, uh, this project has been completely successfully implemented. I am not saying that this will be the final solution. I think we will have to deal with drug addiction and we will have to deal with street prostitution um, as an ongoing problem. But we were able to create a service that would, uh, from a, from a, well, would, would really change that very problematic situation. So these were four projects that I have been doing in Cologne in an educational context. I hope that it was an opportunity to explain a little bit about how we educate young designers and how we apply service design in an educational context. If you want to, to get more background, you might have stumbled over Touchpoint. Touchpoint is a new uh, journal that uh, we publish three times a year. Uh, and uh, well, it does relate to health issues, to change, to uh, behavioral change. So you will find many interesting topics in Touchpoint, our journal. And it is published by the International Service Design Network, by SDN. We also have a, a newsletter for free. We do events and conferences. So uh, I'm doing a bit of promotion and uh, advertisement for the Service Design Network. If you are interested, just have a look at our website. It gives a lot of interesting information around the topic of service design. OK, so I'm a bit breathless. Uh, thank you very much for, for following me through this rush uh, through projects. Um, and now I'm open for questions and answers. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much. Thank you. I, I think we are a bit breathless too, uh, <laughs> because of these wonderful examples. Um, I think we will um, now switch to the Twitter flow and uh, you know the hashtag, you see it there, uh, Design for Better Health. Uh, we have a microphone if you want to ask questions in Swedish or English or German or any other language. Um, Birgit, where you have succeeded, how have you been invited? How, how these places seem to be very fantastic and special places that were really, really um, ready for change. Is it? Is this for everyone? It seems like fairy tales to me <laughs> in a bit. <laughs> well, um, the very first project about homelessness was one that I picked. Uh, and uh, that is the great thing about ed uh, academic environment. I have a lot of freedom to make decisions on what kind of projects I choose to, to work on. And uh, I chose the homelessness project. And in the end, I was really lucky that uh, many people in Cologne were very enthusiastic about the work that we had been doing and put a lot of energy and effort into putting this into reality. 
And, you know, with this project, I did create a bit of a name for social service design projects and people read about it, hear about it. So the city of Eindhoven, for example, they had heard about the Gulliver project. So they approached me and asked, whether it would not be possible to do a project with them. And I found it really, really interesting, especially because Eindhoven is one of those cities that, that really declare that design is an opportunity for change, that design is not about decoration and styling, that design is a means to really make life better for many people. So I was very honored and pleased to work with the city of Eindhoven on this really challenging project. And again, I found a lot of support for the work that we had been doing. So in the end, uh, the project oriented uh, education that I am doing here at KIST gives a lot of opportunities for external partners to, to come up and make suggestions for projects. And, and I have the opportunity to filter and try to pick out those projects that will be good for the students to learn and that will be good for service design as a discipline and bring the discipline forward. So that's a very privileged situation that I am in, I have to say. So if, if probably service design demands investments, we have a question how here, how do you motivate these questions, uh, these investments when they're not so obviously welcoming? Uh, well, I think uh, when, when we try to convince partners, we have to look very, very strictly at the business side of services. And we have to make a clear analysis of the value of interventions. So I do think that uh, the students here uh, at KIST have to learn about business value, about uh, business uh, strategies. But at the other hand, our business partners have to get a more expanded look on value, that it's not only about profitability, that it's also about, uh, about uh, value on a, on a social level, value on a cultural level, value on a customer retention level. So we try to redefine the term of value. We try to look at value in this expanded way. And then we try to identify the uh, return of investment on the basis of this expanded value definition. Thank you. So we have Sigrid here who says, thank you for great examples, Birgit. Can you briefly tell how service design is different from other user-centered approaches? Um, it, it is a, it's a good question and it's a difficult question. Uh, when I started, uh, there was interface and maybe interaction design as disciplines. And uh, at that time, the difference was that service design was really looking at social or uh, governmental or professional service providers and looking at their systems with all the different stakeholders. So service design can be very political, it can be very strategical, it can be very organizational, and it is a lot about the process of change. Um, and at that time, this was radically new as a perspective for t design. Today, I think other design labels like experience design or uh, user design, they, they have taking lots of these approaches and they are working in a similar direction. So I'm, I'm not so sure anymore if there is such a, such a strict border between service design and other disciplines. But I, am I have never been someone to think in these disciplined categories. I think we have to be undisciplined and we have to look at the value that interdisciplinarity can create. And I don't care at all if an experienced designer does this work, but he should be very well educated in these different facets of, of um, service industries and uh, be able to cope with the processes of change and also the political dimensions of change. So yeah, I think my, my core answer is we don't have to be disciplined, we have to be undisciplined and it's more about uh, competencies and experience than about labels. Thank you. So talking about competences, Dr. Sundström here uh, is, uh, asks, is design-based competence generic or is it contextual operative specific? To what extent? And uh, 
I have to admit I don't understand that question. Uh, as I understand it, you were talking about how, how do we educate young people uh, in service design and uh, I had a question of how do we educate healthcare professionals in service design and uh, also I think everyone who has been involved in trying to change the public sector is very um, humble to that a lot of things are so very much uh, contextual specific and there is so much deep knowledge out there so uh, how is this generic something you can work on or is this something you truly need to get deep into with with uh oh well i i have really enjoyed uh, to hear n uh, talk uh, who is uh, deeply rooted in the national health system of the uk and i think they have a lot of experience on the on the um, the the opportunities to educate nurses and doctors and administrative staff with the basics of design thinking and service design methodology uh, and it's a learning by doing process in their case which is very successful uh, i think on this on the on the strategic level if uh, healthcare organizations understand that the only opportunity for change is to think in an interdisciplinary way and the only opportunity for change is to to really involve the different stakeholders into a deeper understanding of, of potentials for innovation. I think then it's already a first step into this um, this change where service design plays a major role in, in health systems. And, and I don't think we have to educate health professionals as deeply in service design as I educate designers. But I think that they should uh, experience the value of uh, the interdisciplinary uh, human-centered approach uh, and um, uh, that they can, can understand a lot of it by doing it. Thank you. We have a question from the audience here. Uh, yes, thank you for an interesting talk. Uh, my name is Jonas and I'm doing a project called the Clinical Innovation Fellowship. And um, I uh, thought about how you selected, in the last project, you selected a few stakeholders to focus on. Uh, but you also talk about how uh, important it is to include all stakeholders. And there you could make a really interesting uh, result, uh, even though you focused on just a few stakeholders. Um, and I experienced similar problems, not touching all the stakeholders in a in a in a clinical project. So, could you elaborate on how that how how the choice of focusing on a few uh, influence results and the process? Well, for for from my perspective, there is two main questions. One is uh, how many resources do we have? Um, and if the resources are limited, uh, we have to, to uh, focus on, on those issues where we can have the most effect the fastest. And in our, in our uh, uh, drug addicted street prostitute project, we felt that it would be really good if we could make a cultural change and, and change the way that pimps and clients deal with women. But we felt that this is such a big topic that we will absolutely not be able to, to tackle it within a six weeks uh, project here at a university. So we said if we want to, to make an impact, we can only focus on those stakeholders that are accessible and that have the, the that have the key for a fast, fast change in the system, not long-term change. So how much resources do we have and what are the key stakeholders that will enable us to make fast change? Thank you. Um, we have a comment here from, from the audience uh, on the World Wide Web. Thanks for the inspiring presentation. In what was the major obstacles in implementing the changes in a healthcare context? Mm, I think the main main problems that I have encountered is that the organizational barriers are very very strict still, um, and uh, that uh, the financial pressure, at least in Germany, is always used as an argument to to um, not um, make change that does not influence savings 
uh, in a direct uh, way. So the discussion was very often about, uh, well, if we invest in a redesign of our website, how will this save money directly? Um, and when we had to put a lot of effort into um, changing the perspective on, a, on an indirect value and on a long-term value. So I would say the organizational barriers were very high and uh, the pressure on the financial situation in our cases, in the cases that I have experienced, was very high. Those were the two main obstacles. You have mentioned uh, new business models or investments needed and I, I think we also hear talk a lot about new services, new business logics that are needed in the public sector, but they're not there yet. So is, is it too disruptive? Uh, well, I mean, we have a long tradition that we come from, so maybe we need a, a, a bit more time and energy for change. But um, I think the role uh, that uh, government plays is quite crucial. And it's a pleasure to observe in the Scandinavian countries that you do get governmental support for, uh, for innovation and change in the public sector. Uh, it's also interesting to observe how the same process takes place in the United Kingdom and now also in Asia, who is putting a lot of energy from a governmental perspective on real innovation for the public sector. Um, I think without the, that support from a high strategic level and a funding that also allows for experiments and for learning in that sector, it will be very, very difficult to to break the structures that have very deep roots in history and that have very deep roots in our culture. So yes, I, I think uh, we need more time and we need a big support from government and a big, big funding would be very helpful for, for those innovations. Thank you. We have another question here. In the academic context, did you work with unexperienced students? How this did this experience influence designers here? Well, I w we have a very interesting approach in education where we do have no uh, strict um, separation between experienced and unexperienced students. So usually in a project uh, we have both very experienced and rather unexperienced students. And I find it really interesting to see how in a very short time of often six to eight weeks, um, the learning curve uh, is, is very, very high. So we start with rather unexperienced students that bring good questions into the project and through their, um, you know, unexperienced mode are rather, rather naive in asking and very fresh. And they, they learn very, very fast and, and bring inspiration to those that are more experienced in how to better do things, how to better explain things. So I really like the mix of, of experience and unexperience because it's the same that we experience when we go out there and work with clients. We always have unexperienced clients that we need to embrace and enable in a very short time. Uh, and I think that's the same learning curve that we go through here when we work in projects with our students. Thank you, Birgit. This is, has been, it's wonderful. And I think we will finish off with a final comment here from, from uh, the Twitter flow. It's uh, from the Service Design Network in Sweden. It, it, it says, let's share and celebrate more great examples of service design in healthcare. And I think that's true for now and true for oh, the future. Yeah. yeah, maybe one comment right now. We are starting to collect case studies. So I would be really happy if, uh, well, those of you that have worked with service design or design in the health context uh, would be willing to share case studies that we would publish on the Service Design Network uh, web page. I think there is a big need for sharing uh, best practices in this area. That's wonderful. And, and uh, I think... Uh, uh, that brings us also to our, our mission and we've been talking about these webinar series and how we might continue and I, I think we are very eager at finding out examples that are out there, uh, how could we, could we present them, could we bring the voice forward. So I think it connects wonderfully to your nice invitation here to, to that, how could that happen, could we contact you or... Um, uh. 
Yes, you could contact me directly at marga at service minus design minus network dot org. Um, and uh, you can, uh, yeah, that would be the best way to, to start. I mean, if anybody has a case study that you want to share, we will help you in, in, you know, preparing it and we will support you in communicating it within the service design community worldwide. That's wonderful. That's just the, like the kind of things we want to do in our LinkedIn group too. So we have a LinkedIn group okay. and uh, you can share things there and you can get in contact. Thank you very okay. much. Thank you very much for making this possible. Thank you. So our next seminar is Wednesday, 17th of April, the same time, same place. Uh, and it will be with uh, Dr. Peter Margolis, who works in something called the Collaborative Chronic Care Network in the US, and he's based at the Cincinnati Children's. He has got some wonderful e examples of how they work <coughs> in the US. And the title of the presentation is how we found the lead users and why that was extremely important. Thank you for today. Thank you. Bye bye.